Hi, I'm Vanessa Rosenblum. And I'm Ryan McCarty, and you're listening to the Behind the Model podcast, where we uncover the methods and mindsets of real estate's top producers. Join us each week as we peek behind the curtain to learn the business hacks, best practices, and life lessons these top agents use to build thriving and profitable businesses. When we aren't interviewing top producers for the podcast, we're helping real estate agents and brokers leverage, innovate, and diversify their real estate business into multiple streams of income. Learn more at lid.consulting. Let's get into the podcast. Hey, it's Vanessa and Ryan from the Behind the Model podcast. And this week we interviewed Joey Wang from the Wang Multifamily Group up in Berkeley, California. And Ryan, this was such an interesting interview. I, I think my favorite takeaway was the relationship manager role and how he separates out the ISA role, the like that lead capture from the lead cultivation. That was definitely my favorite too. It's the, uh, what I liked about Joey is that he is service focused and like relationship and long-term. And what I think about a lot of, that's opposite of a lot of realtors who, you know, get started or growing teams or when they're busy, you know, they get the, a bunch of leads and their, their thought is like, well, let me just grab an agent, put them on my team really quick and just form this team of a bunch of people that don't have any support that don't, that all have end up having the same problem, which is how do I get a hold of my clients and keep in contact with them? And what's the value that I add? And we, you know, what's that process like? And so I like that right at, you know, the core of what he's doing, Joey is really focused on the consumer, the customer, the client, the process, like providing that value, going deep and the relationship, you know, and that he gets that that's not just a CRM. You know, I think for me, a lot of times, you know, people think when I see when I'm coaching, they just CRM everyone and they think that's it. And everyone just wants to get a random email. You know, yeah, but exactly. You know, but I also, I mean, as a, as a leadership coach, to hear him say, "I expect everyone on my team to grow and level up and go to the next level," and I mean, my it was like going ding, 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 because that is such a he's put such a challenge on himself. Because if he wants growth, he has to continue to level himself up, continue to be a better leader, to create opportunities, to mentor and encourage people, and. That, like he has really leaned into that leadership role and he's going places. I mean, yeah. that is going to be his ticket to expanding mm -hmm. his team. What did he say? If after three years, you're still in the same role, we're going to let you go. Yeah. I expect. And so at I first you're like, wait a minute. Like, and you go, well, where does that come from? What well, it comes from. It comes from the growth mindset. Right. Yeah. And what I hear in that is you're right. I mean, he's, he has to put his, you know, money's where his mouth is basically. And he has to live by, you know, that saying that they, that said, I don't know who says this, <clears throat> but talent will only follow you as far as they think you can take them. And yep. so his team of 10, they're only following him as far as they think he can take them. Right. And so that is in three years, if you're in the same role, we're going to replace you. Yeah. Right. Because he, has he has to them. be moving at a pace that they can move at a pace that they can create their new, you know, I was thinking about like, okay, so let's just say he's talking to his listing coordinator, the listing coordinator is thinking, well, wait, in three years, I'm still doing this listing coordination job. I don't have a job. And I think what he's saying there is like, make your role robust enough, grow it enough that we have so many listings that you have to hire listing coordinator assistants. <laughs> you yeah. need people to help you with your role because it became such a big, huge part of our company, such an integral part of our company that you have, you've grown it so much that it's just this own unit, right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's get into the interview and share with everyone. And hey, you guys, make sure to follow for more. We release new interviews about every week, every other week. We're, we're getting our schedule in line. And if you are looking to grow a team, whether in residential or multifamily, this is what Ryan and I do. We lean in and help teams build systems, people, and lean into their leadership skill set. So check us out at lid.consulting if that's something that is interesting to you. Okay, without further ado, let's get into the interview. 
Hey, Joey, thanks for joining us on the podcast today. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate you know this opportunity to speak with you guys. Yeah, well, I had such a good time talking to your executive assistant, Rachel, a couple of weeks ago for the Offer Accepted podcast. And so it's going to be so much fun to take what I learned talking to her and what I've learned about your team from her perspective, and then kind of get the other side of the story here. So let's just dive right in. Can you give us the, the high level picture of your team model? Sure. Yeah. So, you know, my team, I'm a solo agent, Williams, though I am in the process of hopefully bringing more agents this year, but solo agent. And, you know, I've been doing this since 2011. So it's been now, and I focus specifically on multifamily sales here in the San Francisco East Bay. Even though I'm a solo agent, I do have a pretty big support team behind me. My approach to real estate has always been rooted in commitment to the multifamily community and in everything I do. So to accomplish that, you know, I have various uh, folks on my team to aid me in that. And uh, so I, yeah, there's 10 people me, and then they're all pretty much virtual. There's a local person here, a coordinator that, you know, helps me with otherwise the rest of the team virtual. So when you, when people hear that you have 10 people on your team that you are paying <clears throat> salaries to every month, their heads are probably exploding because that sounds like a very scary, big commitment. So kind of explain the different roles, how many of them are based in the U S versus overseas and why on earth would, you know, and I get it, but playing devil's advocate, why on earth would you employ so many people versus, you know, having buyer's agents? It didn't happen this way overnight, it morphed into, you know, as my business was growing, you know, what could I offload and what made sense to offload? So I started with a VA from the Philippines because, you know, at that time I wasn't making as much money. Like, okay, I can't afford to hire like a person locally here. What can I do? And so I hired, you know, a VA in the Philippines pay them five dollars an hour and uh, and basically she did everything that administratively for me you know so preparing contracts helping me with marketing researching listings right monitoring my emails and then i also then hired an isa i needed someone to help me making sure that we're constantly prospecting while I was going out in meetings. Those were really my two hires. And from there, my VA became, now it's five VAs. So she basically hired four other VAs under her because as the business was growing, she couldn't handle everything. And so she bringing all the different responsibilities into four other VAs. So we have now basically a database VA. She is responsible for just maintaining our database of contacts and properties. We have a marketing VA responsible for, you know, preparing all of our marketing stuff, including our offering memorandums, you know, our email flyers, our postcards. We have two business analysts. So these are folks, and this is very specific to multifamily, you know, there's a lot of financial analysis involved, right? And so they are there to prepare um, all the research for the valuations I do and uh, preparing the financial analysis, crunching the numbers. They're even as good as they can come up with the value, even though all these VAs, by the way, are in the Philippines, but they, they've done this enough where they can even tell me, okay, this is the value of the multifamily you know, here in Berkeley. So something I'm really proud of. Um, and then I have my original VA. She's now the lead VA and she oversees, you know, the VA team. Um, I also have a executive assistant. Well, actually, she's now my director of ops. And then I have a field coordinator, like I said, I have a relationship manager, and then I have a tech person as well. So I think that captures all the 10. Okay. And are any of those people in the U.S. other than Rachel? 
your director of ops? Yeah, so my ISA, my relationship manager, my tech, and my uh, director of ops are in the U.S., and then my field coordinator, field coordinator is down here in the Bay Area with me. Got it. Okay. Talk about the relationship man. You said relationship manager. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Well, essentially what was happening was, you know, my ISA was sending these appointments, you know, it's going on these appointments and we don't ever decline appointments. Like we don't ever filter out appointments for just hot leads. Anyone who's in our farm area that's willing to go through the process of providing us information about the property for us to do evaluation on, we will take the time to meet with them because at the end of the day, we understand that it's a long-term relationship, right? And off planting the seeds and they may not look to sell in, in a few months, but maybe a few years, but we want to be there. And so he was signing all these appointments and I was going to appointments. And at some point I couldn't manage how to follow up with all these people I was going to appointments for, you know, three months down the line, six months, a year down the line, I'm thinking to myself, what was my last conversation with this person? And, you know, it's a lot of just backtracking on, okay, what was the last conversation? What should I bring up? And I was spending a lot of time on just that prep work. And so that's where my relationship came in, where I said, okay, I kind of need someone to just help me think through these relationships and help me to nurture these relationships while I'm not on the phone with them, you know, between the few months, between the few years, and also telling me, okay, Joey, you got to, you got to call this person. This was the last conversation you've had. And, and so that's, that's what she does. Got it. Okay. So you really, you, for some people, they would have their ISA do that, but you keep your ISA focused on new leads. And then any, once they've been met, they get moved to the relationship manager for nurturing. Is that? That's right. Okay. That's right. Yeah. It's a very different skill set. You know, someone who is out there just banging the phones and generating leads versus someone who is behind the scenes and thinking thoughtfully about the relationship right? It's, it's, it really is kind of two different focuses. So that's why I ended up, you know, hiring a specific person for that. Ryan, I don't think I've heard of anybody think about it that way. And I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. As far as getting a customer service manager. Yeah. And in, 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 in terms of separating out the lead gen from the lead cultivation. Oh yeah. 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 I love uh, that. I don't know that I have, well, I don't know that I have either, you know, I think, you know, that's kind of the hard part about having, you know, being in the real estate space and having a team or anything, right? Like the lead gen and the follow-up and the prop and the calling and the incubating and the massaging and the connecting to value, because, you know, there's that, you know, you're not supposed to just be following up for follow-up sake and it takes time to go a little bit deeper. You know, it takes time to get that information. It takes time to provide that value. It takes time to kind of understand, you know, where they're at. So I think leveraging that piece, I think, you know, it almost makes you think, is that the first hire? Because it's the hardest thing to kind of, it's the most important thing. And it's the hardest thing, I think, if you're generating enough leads to keep track of, you know, I remember uh, years ago, I had, I called him a client services manager, I believe was his title. And his goal was to take in any lead that came in, right? From phone call to closing, right? And to massage that lead. And I remember he he loved to call me and be like, hey, remember that investor I told you about six months ago that called about so-and-so property? We just put him in contract on two properties, you know, from our follow-up. And and that gap is really difficult. So that's that's how how long have you had that? Oh gosh, it's been it's been about three years, I believe. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Same I mean, she there? she was a very that was a really key hire for me because honestly, it was really hard for me to make my connects for the day because I was spending time on the prep, right? And that was a big challenge for me. You know, I, ha I had my conversation goal that I had to hit, but I had all these. Appointments I had to go to, and 
when I was just in, analyzing where I was spending my time, it was like, wow, all this prep time, just thinking about the people. And then, you know, then you start seeing people I've, I've met in the past. They, maybe I lost that opportunity to listen to someone else and you're thinking, I'm thinking, okay, what happened? Right. And of course it's because I didn't build that strong relationship and our team put so much effort and resources into getting our foot in the door. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, we, it's so much time and effort to get our foot in the door that when we get our foot in the door, you know, it hit me like, we've got to spend just as much time and effort on being in front of them when, after we got our foot in the door. So that's where she came in. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's not a third and not everything's a, you meet them, they write an offer 30 days later, they close, but like, and that becomes very, that's transactional, right? Versus. Yes excuse me guys, versus the relationship part of the process of moving them forward. And I tell the people that I coach, I go, you know, out of habit, we say, follow up, follow up, follow up, follow up. Like that's the thing. But I heard someone say the other day, like, don't use the F word in real estate. And I was like, ah, oh, I get it. Cause you're just following up to follow up. It's more follow through, you know, connect them to the next thing based off of our last conversation. What we talked about was, da, 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 da. but to remember and document and CRM, I don't know about you. I'm pretty good at getting the information. I'm horrible at writing it down. I'm horrible at putting in a CRM. I'm horrible at that. The storage up here is what I use, you know? So <laughs> smart. We, only, we, we can only hold so much information. Correct. And that, that was the exact challenge I was going through. So, well, one yeah, of the I things, that. Joey, that, that we connected on before the call was about you're always in search of value add opportunities to share with clients. So is that something that this person is sort of in charge of thinking through as well? You know, everyone has a really specific role in our team and they really understand what their focus is. What is their one thing for this specific person, this relationship manager, she's super clear on what her one thing is, you know, which is, you know, how do I build relationships with these people such that when they are thinking of selling at that point, they're not even thinking of anyone else because by default, they're thinking of the one. Right. So that's her goal. And it's, you know, from very beginning to end, how do we add so much value to these folks that they see us as you know, the, 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 the key agent to go to the key resource to go to, because at that point they feel so comfortable with us. Why would they, you know, interview anyone else? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Let's switch gears just a little bit and talk about the workflow. So you have your relationship manager, they're finally ready. They say, yes, I'm ready to sell. How are you guys? Cause so one of the, let me back up. One of the things that Rachel and I talked about was your Slack channel and how dialed in you guys are, the way you communicate and utilize Salesforce and Slack to move people through the process. So can you share a little bit about that? And I'll also link to Rachel's interview below for anyone who wants more detail on that. Yeah, it all starts with, uh, it all starts with our ISA and he's out there, you know, reaching folks and offering to do valuations or, you know, we hold webinars. So, you know, we're letting people in the area know about a webinars and then just using those calls to find opportunities to serve, right? What can we help you with today? It doesn't necessarily need to be, you know, doing a valuation or selling. It's just, what can we help you, right? Because at the end of the day, you know, our commitment is to serve the multifamily community and not just owners, but vendors and, and everyone. And so you, out of those conversations arises sometimes, hey, you know, we're thinking of selling or, hey, you know, we're, we're planning to sell in the next year or two, right? And then we start down the road of doing evaluation for them. Um, so from there, I mean, our, our VA team really then, once, they, once the owners return to me information about the property I need to do the valuation, my VA team really takes it over. I mean, they get the rents, to get the expenses. Like I said, they put the analysis together, they pull comps, rent comps, seal comps, and then prepare the, you know, a very professional, what we call broker's opinion value. I think residential agents may call it CMAs, mm -hmm. competitive market analysis. And then, you know, I meet with the owners 
And usually it just depends on what kind of happens from those meetings, you know, what their goals are. And, you know, for example, usually when owners are looking to sell, they're usually doing a 10 throwing exchange. So usually a conversation morphs into what are your goals, right? Because they're usually not just selling a cash now. So what are your goals, right? And then from there, based on those goals, we look at options and that's where my team comes back in and figure out those options and I meet with them. So it's a, it's a, it's never just, it, I don't think I've ever had a meeting where it's like, okay, meet with them, sign the listing, let's go. I mean, it is usually an iterative process, a series of all these meetings before we ultimately do a deal together. Definitely. And then once they've signed and you're, you know, you have the listing, how involved are you in managing the listing and, and the, the contract to close process? Now, I mean, before, of course, when the team was very small, I was pretty much involved in, in everything. Now, um, not so much, though we do a lot to get properties ready. Much more so, I think, than in my opinion, than anyone else. I mean, the level of detail and information we gather is, it's a lot, you know, for any one person to do. And so, um, you know, we have our team get all the utility statements, get all the financials, you know, get all the reports done. We coordinate all the stuff, all the inspections and photography in like one session in one day so we don't bother the tenants unnecessarily, right? It's like these little things that we think about to achieve a smooth process, not just for the seller, but obviously, honestly for the tenants involved because that's they're a really key stakeholder when we're listing a property, you know, making sure that they remain cooperative and, and work with us along mm -hmm. the sales process. So when I get in, it really is just writing the sale talking points and then that's really it on the prep side. Once the property launches, I do get involved then with reaching out to our database, you know, reaching out to agents, reaching out to buyers, negotiating. And my job at that point is to make sure that I negotiate a deal that is strong enough that when we get in a contract, it doesn't fall out. And then once again, the contract if I do a good enough job, then my team can just take it over and close from there. Perfect. And your, you mentioned your goal of adding agents to the team. Have you had other sales agents on the team in the past? We've had one end of last year. Unfortunately, it didn't work out. And we certainly learned from that. And so we're reworking things on our end. But yes, we are looking to you know bring on additional agents. Our goal really is to have really hyper-local multifamily specialists that serves key areas. Mm -hmm. So, you know, our goal is to have like, for example, we serve the East Bay, San Francisco East Bay. <clears throat> I'm really known as the Berkeley multifamily expert, but, you know, we want someone who's able to serve Oakland, city of Oakland, someone who can serve city of Alameda, right? And they are kind of the center of that multifamily community helping all the owners and connecting people and and really providing that value to whoever is in that area ultimately to everyone yeah well and you know this reminds me of the model that renee white has built with her team on the residential side and i'll link to her interview below you guys she likes to say that they're a team of experts or a team of specialists and her buyer's agents are so incredibly leveraged because they have such a strong admin staff. And it sounds like you have really laid the foundation to be able to do that as well, where they're really going to be able to focus on their specialty, which is converting leads, negotiating, you know, really focusing on being that expert and not having to think about the administrative, the technology, the marketing, the, the, like everything else, right? That's right. So yeah. that's so smart that you've, you know, you kind of slowed down, laid this foundation and prepared yourself to be able to one, offer a lot of value to the people that you bring on, right? Like you'll, you'll be able to attract a totally different type of agent because you have so much to offer. And then you know exactly what they're supposed to do. 
And so it's very clear to say, this is how we do things around here. This is the model. You're either on mm -hmm. board to follow it or you're not, we're not a good fit to work together. Right. And then right. you plug them in. And I'm excited to talk to you, you know, in two years from now and just see what you've built because like you took the time to, to really build the foundation. And so it's only up from yeah. here. Well, our goal is to right now, like I said, I, you know, I focus on East Bay. Oakland is where I do most of my transactions, but, you know, our goal is to eventually across the entire Bay area, including Sacramento, and then eventually nation. Like you said, perfecting that model, figuring out what works, what doesn't. Or, you know, it's that's the beauty of it. And that's what I love, you know, every day is is building that with my team. Totally. Speaking of models that you've built, let's talk about some of the technology that you lean into. So I mentioned that you, you guys use Salesforce <clears throat> and Slack. Do you want to talk a little bit more about your thought process on like which pieces of tech you've chosen to, to work with? Yeah, Salesforce is a big, is that's our CRM that mm -hmm. holds all of our contacts in our properties. And we chose Salesforce from the very beginning because, you know, I knew someday that we were going to expand the team and I wasn't going to be the only agent. So it was a really thoughtful decision at that time to choose a tech that could easily communicate with other tech. Mm -hmm. um, so Salesforce, I mean, it's, Everything connects with Salesforce, right? It's it's yeah, <laughs> right. So Salesforce and then, like you said, Slack is the way, that's our world for the team. I mean, that's how we are able to communicate with one another, send messages with one another. And we use it for all of our transactions. We use it for all of our... You know, the, lead generation process. I mean, everything. It's all, it's all in stock. So we don't really, we try to avoid email, right? Sending each other emails. Actually, the only, the only time I look at my inbox, honestly, is, is the outside world, you know, to, to agents or owners. So that's Slack. And then there's a lot of tools that we integrate with Slack. There's a lot of tools that we integrate with Salesforce as well. We use, we, we have our phone system, which we use Haymarket and, and what's it, Dialpad. Um, Haymarket is a really great tool to be able to communicate at scale at a personalized level. And of course that integrates with Salesforce. And uh, yeah, I, I we have we use a lot of tech because it's we, you know I think every one of those tech pieces just helps us be able to deliver a personalized experience, but at scale. And it's you know all the tech we use you know allows us to achieve that. So perfect. Sorry, I had I was thinking about where I wanted to go next. I want to switch gears just a little bit and talk about your director of operations, Rachel. One of the stories she told in our interview was how she didn't have any real estate experience when she came into the role and she beat out some other candidates. So I want to talk about your thought process in how, why her, somebody that you had to train up from scratch, what were some of the benefits and some of the challenges with that? Yeah, she had no background in real estate. Um, but what I really saw in her was a drive versus other maybe more experienced folks who mm -hmm. I think, although they're experienced, I needed someone to understand where we were going and passionate about it and not just see it as a job. Um, and, you know, Rachel, I mean, you spoke to her. I mean, she's, she's very passionate about what she does very energetic and honestly she's she's the culture of the team uh, she really helps keep this team motivated stay motivated and and together you know that's very little on me it's actually very much on her so um, her her role has really evolved i mean when she first came on it was just her her one thing was okay how do i take the 80 percent from joey so joey can work on his 20 percent 
And so she's really helped do a lot of the hiring and the, and, and, and the building of this team. And, and, and now she's more focused on building out, you know, this buyer agent program, right. That we, you know, we're trying to bring on more buyers agents. So she's really focused on that now. Perfect. All right. Yeah. She definitely has the drive and the energy and I think it can, yes. In the beginning, when you have to explain what is a buyer versus a seller and, you know, what is a BPO and all this kind of stuff that can feel really tiring. But when you find the right person, it's so much more important than that experience. If they have the attention to detail, the, like we said, drive and energy, the organizational skills, the tech skills, you can teach them real estate. We've all learned real estate. That's the easy yeah. part, really. And I think if you are investing in somebody like that, you can end up with such a great long-term hire and people get a little short-sighted because they want to take the shortcut and just take the admin from the team down the street. But like newsflash, just because they know how that team did things doesn't mean that they know how you think do things. You're still going to have to train them. So yeah, that's, well right. the that's really key. That's really key. And we have a really good process <clears throat> that one of the things that we laugh about was, I think, one of the first things that when Rachel first came in, she learned was to help me with valuations and, you know, reviewing the research and coming up with a value. Our VAs do that now, like I said, but she was doing that before and not coming from real estate and not knowing anything about multifamily. She was able to accurately assess value within 5% wow. of properties, right? And But we had a really clear cut way of pulling information and knowing how to analyze it that even someone like her with no experience came in and, and was able to value right yeah. within within pretty close accuracy right <clears throat> sometimes you know there's the whole success leaves clues right well so does failure right like <laughs> and so I think the hard part is, and that's not to say that you can't hire someone in the real estate space that has hit their head against the ceiling and they've decided that maybe this role is not for them and they need to transition to something else. The hard part is when you look at it, you go, okay, so success leaves clues, so does failure. I get all that. like, And I've got this person who knows nothing of real estate. So do I teach them real estate or do I teach this person mindset and passion and drive? Hmm. Right. Like I'm going to pick this one all day long because here's the deal. We all have to learn something when we go into a different field. It's the passion and the drive and the mindset that we in the and the the you know the emotional intelligence that we have already, hopefully, that we bring to the role that then we can grow in that role. So I I hired over the years a lot of people that were new and I found that it you know, it went either way. Sometimes they, they didn't work, they did work, but it, the difference in the mindset is just vast, you know, yeah. um, the difference in the capacity or how it's done, or sometimes just that conversation is sitting down with Rachel and, and being able to connect with her and teach her a contract and teach her, this is what a BPO is. This is how we do this. This is how we pull comps. There's that connection that happens and that camaraderie and that vibe and that whole teamwork that you wouldn't get if you'd said, hey, can you run comps on that? Oh, I know how to do that. I got that, right? So that that team building piece, I think, is missing sometimes when we don't build from that ground up, you know? So I'm a fan one of that. One of the things that's really important for us is when we look to hire people, they've got to be growth-minded. Yeah, They've got to be willing to learn and constantly be willing to grow they may not have the mindset of, you know, thinking big and, you know, like a lot of people we hire from the Philippines. I don't know if it's because of their culture or what, you know, they don't necessarily tend to think bigger than what they are hired to do, but, and that's okay with us because that's our job to help them be able to see that they can achieve more, but it's our expectation with everyone of our team. Like you have to be learning and growing each and every day, each and every week. In fact, we have a rule, which is if after three years, if you're in the same role, we're going to let you go. Wow. Because if you don't, if you're in the same role in three years, that means the business is stagnant. 
and you are not growing and you're not, the business will outgrow your talents at that point. And that's happened with some of our people, you know, some very talented people came in, but they, they didn't grow along with the business. It's really crazy, you know, what our business was like three years ago and five years ago. I mean, just a span of three years, it's a really big difference, right? And if we are to achieve our vision of eventually growing Bay Area wide and venture nationally, like we can't do it with just this team right now, right? And so everyone, one of the things I tell everyone is you're a leader, you're a foundational piece to this future department, right? And so they have to, you have some of them, you have to get them to see themselves in that capacity. And some of them, you kind of have to force it, you know, like this rule that we implement. But when they go through that growth phase and that learning phase, they realize, oh, they, they just achieved this hurdle. They're like, wow, okay, this is really cool. Like I did this and they're really happy about it. And then they go through the next hurdle. But that's really what it takes, right? Because we're not going to be able to accomplish what we can through just hiring outside people. It's It's got to be the people from within, growing them, nurturing them, and then repeating that same process with, with everyone else that we bring on. Yeah. What's so interesting about this is that this puts a challenge on you because you have to keep growing the business to create opportunities for these people because otherwise you become the lid to their achievement. And then we have the opposite problem where they're bumping their head up against your capacity, right? So you've put yourself in a position where you, you've got to create opportunities and grow and expand and create that ladder for them to, to climb. And that's right. Yeah. That just highlights I, your leadership capacity and your willingness to continue to grow in that area. Yeah. And that the team knows, and I've told them this, like, I'm not going to be a real estate agent forever, guys. Like, even though we're building this whole system around me right now and it's very effective and still in me as the Berkeley multifamily specialist. But in order to, we got a much bigger vision than just a sales team. You know, we've got other ideas of how we can continue to build this business to be able to support the community outside of just a sales team. But in order for me to be able to focus on those or Rachel to be able to focus on those, we've got to grow from our current roles. So I, you know, they know I'm, I can't be an agent forever. It's, you know, yeah. but I am serving that role right now because, you know, the team needs it. Brilliant. So let's talk about the kind of agents you're interested in hearing from. If anyone happens to be listening to this podcast, who's your ideal next hire? One, again, someone who's willing to come in and learn and grow. Who, someone who wants to be part of building a community of where they are, right? That's really important for us because we're not just simply interested in people who want to just come in and make money, but to do good for, again, the, the folks that they come across, right? So, and then someone who, you know, wants to really be okay, that they're okay with just focusing on a specialization. You know, for us, we found that to be our key advantage to the, uh, against other real estates out there is, is our intense focus on multifamily in specific areas. And so someone who is willing to be part of that team to be able to help this business grow and eventually be that powerhouse. Perfect. And do they need to have a certain number of deals under their belt before you'd consider them? We're open to interviewing anyone and, you know, whether they're experienced or not. I think for us, you know, do they fit within the values of the team? Do they, ha do they see and get excited with our vision of where we want to go? Do they want to be on board with that? That's what's really important for us. Perfect. Well, I'll leave Joey's information below for anyone who is interested in interviewing for Joey's team. And Joey, I want to thank you so much. This was such an insightful interview and so many good nuggets. The way you've leveraged yourself, your commitment to growth and, and growing the people who are part of your team, I think it was a really great highlight and the relationship manager piece, I think was a big aha. So thank you for sharing all of that. I really appreciate you. Thank you for having me on. All right, take care.